So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and honored guests, thank you for joining me today uh, as we delve into a critical examination uh, of the ever-evolving political landscape of Turkey. Our focus would be on the complex relationship between Turkey's shift towards authoritarianism and corresponding trajectory of human rights within the nation. The significance of this analysis lies not only in the academic importance, but its uh, real-world implications for the targeted groups facing systematic human rights violations, persecution, and dehumanization. As we um, uh, embark on this exploration, uh, we will shed light on the deliberate strategies employed by the Turkish regime targeting specific groups with a precision that extends beyond mere political opposition. Two characteristics, two characteristic cases we're going to be focusing on, Kurdish movement and the Gulen movement. Understanding these cases, their narratives, and the mechanisms of their persecution provides us with essential insights into the authoritarian turn in Turkey. So my basic interest is not only talking about human rights, but also connecting that topic with the political system of Turkey, which is in a big shift, and many people are ignoring that. So I propose that critical elements such as human rights, the rule of law, separation of powers, checks and balances, free media, fundamental freedoms, and independent judiciary are essential for categorizing um, a nation as a democracy. Presently, Turkey falls short of meeting these criteria. So moreover, I oppose the idea that achieving um, a regime change in Turkey, so getting back to democratization, rule of law uh, orientation of the country, uh, is very hard to uh, be achieved through democratic elections. So what is democratic elections? Uh, we have two different approaches in political science. One is the, uh, based on uh, the uh, minimalist democracy definition, which assumes there is a democracy in a country if we have elections. But the problem with that definition is we have a lot of countries, they do have elections, but they, they're not democracies. Russian Federation, for example, Venezuela, or Belarus. So those countries, they, they have regular elections, but nobody ex expects, you know, when, when uh, you know, Putin is a candidate or Lukashenko is a candidate, that uh, they're going to lose the election at the end of the day. So the, the same thing is happening in Turkey right now. So I want to uh, bring evidence based on human rights violations that Turkey is not a democracy anymore. So ladies and gentlemen, as we explore Turkey's recent political uh, evolution, two parallel processes have unfolded, reshaping the nation's governance. On one hand, Turkey has gradually transitioned into an authoritarian regime, a transformation noted by scholars. On the other hand, the political system has shifted from a parliamentary model to a Turkish-style presidential one, signaling a departure from democracy norms or democratic norms uh, and rule of law. So Turkey is moving away from democracy. The consensus in the literature is clear. Turkey is no longer a functioning liberal democracy, but rather a hybrid regime. So let's, so, sorry about that. I'm not used to that kind of stuff. So I, normally I'm just teaching as a regular professor and I don't, I don't have that kind of good technology, guys. Sorry about that. So, um, I talked about the consensus uh, in the literature. So people gradually understand something is wrong. The picture is like, you know, we see Turkey um, meeting with European leaders, with NATO. Turkey is part of NATO. Turkey is a European Union candidate. Uh, Turkey is a fancy country showing itself as a very democratic, uh, you know, accepted in the Western uh, world, that kind of country. And 
this is just a fake. Right now, it's not anymore uh, the case. So the crucial moment happened in 2013, started to change the Turkey that we used to know. So during Gezi Park protests, where Erdogan felt his authority was challenged, the government's response set the tone, peaceful opposition faced force, paving the way for a decline in democracy. The next key event in the same year, 2013, so 2013, 13 is an unlucky number, right? So uh, just a joke, but 2013 was a really, really unlucky year for Turkey. The corruption scandal happened in 2013, in December. So that scandal involving Erdogan's family and officials was a very significant milestone. The next key event was a huge impact. This move tightened the grip on media narratives, branding journalists as terrorists. That happened for the first time in Turkey. Okay, that happened in smaller scales in Turkish politics. Like one or two journalists were accused of um, you know, committing terrorism or um, supporting terrorism, but not, not in that massive amount of journalists. Like we're talking about hundreds of journalists being jailed, being persecuted. So Erdogan's tightening grip on power, the breakdown of alliances, and the ab abandonment of uh, former associates underscored the erosion of democratic principles in Turkey. What started as an optim optimistic trajectory towards democratization throughout the um, EU reforms and uh, Turkey becoming gradually, and, um, you know, uh, gr uh, gradually a stable democracy, human rights, uh, records of Turkey were getting better and better every single year, started in 2019 up to 2010, even up to 2011, we see a gradual increase in almost everything. Turkey was becoming a real democracy. There was hope over there. So that's why the European Union gave Turkey the uh, status of a candidate and decided to start accession negotiations. It was not random. It doesn't happen every single day that the European Union does that to other countries. That was a really important momentum. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, for the purpose of this presentation, it's imperative to delve deeply into two specific groups, as I mentioned before. So, uh, the Kurdish movement and the Gulen movement, uh, and how the collective punishment for those two groups occurred, and have been still occurring, it's still a process, it's not, we're not talking about past, it's still going on. So uh, while acknowledging the challenges faced by various segments of Turkish society, the focus on these two entities provides a concentrated examination of the regime's intensive efforts to suppress dissidents and consolidate its power. So, the Kurdish movement struggles with Turkish supremacist nationalist uh, discourse aimed at assimilation and marginalization and a narrative, narrative construction that portrays the Kurds as a threat to Turkey's national unity. So the Turkish government is basically saying that being a Kurd and speaking their own language, having their own culture is a crime. And it's a very bad thing for, for Turkey's national unity. So what national unity are they talking about? It's the Turkish supremacist national unity. It's not a civic identity, which is giving all citizens a certain identity, which is based on rules and norms and a you know, common future. Like in many countries, we're in Belgium. Belgium is that kind of identity. Canada, Australia, a lot of countries have a civic identity, not Turkey. Turkey's identity talks about Turks in an ethnic racial concept. Turks coming from Central Asia, you know, replacing the indigenous people in Anatolia. This is the main history that the students learn at school. Of course, Kurds 
don't want that, want that. They don't like that because they're not ethnic Turks. You wouldn't like that either. You know, if Turkey would come to you and say, let's say you're a German, and Turkey would say, well, you're not a German, you're a Turk. Well, I'm speaking German, I'm a German, how come? Right, this is almost a farce. It's a stupid situation, that's what we're dealing with in Turkey. So, um, by portraying the Kurdish movement as a danger to national cohesion, Erdogan's regime lays the groundwork for justifying repressive policies, and here it comes. It's not just in vain. It's not like um, Erdogan doesn't like the Kurds. It's not just like it's his hobby to persecute Kurds. There is a purpose over there. He wants more power. How can he gain this power? He talks about dangerous things, you know, like, oh, our, our national unity is undermined. We need to, we need a stronger government. We need a more powerful grip. That's how it works. So he's instrumentalizing the Kurds and the danger coming from the Kurdish movement in order to become more and more powerful for his own political goals. So the mission fueled by nationalist appetite, not only criticizes the Kurdish cause, but also hinders the rightful request for Kurdish rights and autonomy. Understanding this dimension of the regime's mission is crucial for unpacking the broader dynamics of Turkish politics. It illuminates the intentional deployment of nationalist discourse as a strong tool for suppressing. Suppressing who? Suppressing critical voices within the Kurdish community and consolidating power under the executive of protecting national unity. As we navigate through these complex narratives, it becomes evident that the Kurdish issue is not merely a regional concern, but a central piece in the puzzle of Erdogan's authoritarian agenda. As we delve into the uh, complex or complicated dynamics of the Kurdish movement's uh, persecution, it is essential to underscore the gravity of the situation by examining some alarming numerical data. So the good thing is we talk about it, about the content, what's going on. But in order to, you know, I know that many uh, people from Turkey or many academics who are doing research on that topic, they know those things. But how about you guys? So without numbers, it's always very, very difficult to understand the magnitude of the persecution, the magnitude of the massive human rights violations. So we need numbers, and that's important. So here, some numbers. I mean, when I was writing this, it was striking because normally I read those things on Twitter, I read those things on human rights rep reports, but you know, when you summarize them, when you put them together, it's striking. It's really like you, you get goosebumps, you know, when you write something like that, it's because it's about people, guys. Now think about this, these numbers, 8,930, what does it say? It says 8,930 HDP members, so the pro-Kurdish Democratic Party, detained, 2,782 imprisoned, 494 HDP party offices attacked. 700 party officials were arrested along with 42 munis municipal co-chairs. So when I say like municipal co-chairs, it kind of sounds dry. What does it mean is there are provinces in Turkey where Kurds are predominantly the main ethnic group, right? It's 80%, 90% Kurdish. When there are elections over there, people are voting and you know, electing their own representatives, let's say, let's say a mayor. And those mayors, they're getting mostly more than 60%, even 70% of the whole votes. It's an amazing score. So when, uh, when we talk about those people officially elected, jailed, it's like, incomprehensible 
for any type of liberal democracy in the world. How come that a, you know, elected mayor the next day goes to jail? Can that happen in Belgium? I don't think so. So, um, 69 municipal court chairs were arrested, 58 dismissed and replaced by 50 municipalities. Replaced by who? By the government, arbitrarily. There is no re-election procedures. The government says, this person is a terrorist, go to jail, red card to you. Who's gonna come and replace this person? Oh, I, I have this friend over there, you know, the friend of the party, the friend of Erdogan, the friend of the clique. Let's call him and bring him over there. He's not a Kurd. He doesn't care about Kurdish rights. He's not a politician. He's going to serve the regime. This is how the regime is consolidating itself, guys. So, 84 municipalities had co-mayors dismissed replaced by state-appointed trustees and around 10,000 Kurdish employees working in those municipalities or used to work in, the, in those municipalities were suspended. Which means it's not only changing the mayor, it's changing the entire you know, personnel over there. 117 investigations were initiated, totaling 683 cases since the attempted coup about 2,000 HDP members have been detained. And 2,000 plus were killed, 10,000 plus houses destroyed in Jizre only. 10,000 houses. We're not talking about an earthquake. It's not a geology lecture, okay? It's about politics. That's what the government is doing. It happened only in 2016. Within a couple of months, 10,000 houses destroyed in Jizre only. Jizre is one small city. Majority of internally displaced persons in southwest Turkey, so in, in the Kurdish regions, uh, the majority of those, uh, those displaced persons are uh, located. And the number is 355,000 up to half a million, mainly Kurds. So when we talk about displaced people in Turkey, it's pro predominantly Kurdish people. And at least 355,000 were displaced uh, uh, from Jizre, Silopi, and Southeast Turkey due to security operations. Now, that gives a clear picture of what's going on with Kurds. Now, let's come to, other, come to our next case. Our next case is Gulen movement. Now, to be clear, those are two different categories. One is an ethnic group. The other is a, is a religious, social, um, civil society organization which is considered by the Turkish government as a terrorist organization, FETO. So FETULA is terrorist organization in quotation marks. Like my fingers are getting more muscly when I make like all the time this. So um, delving deeper into the, into the impacts of the attempted coup in Turkey, because it is connected with that. Yeah, my friend uh, Vedat Oje is showing me <laughs> and helping me. Those are uh, horrible uh, pictures, but we can uh, look at them later. So uh, everything is connected with 2016 uh, military coup attempt, right? Why? Because the uh, government used it, the Erdogan regime used it as a, as a political uh, power excuse, so to speak, if you will. So the Gulen movement, led by the exiled cleric Fethullah Gulen, was uh, once an influential socio-religious movement with a substantial uh, presence in various sectors in Turkish society. Individuals affiliated with, uh, with that movement worked in education, media, bureaucracy, and judiciary. Why? Because they were, they were Turkish citizens, okay? Very simple fact. You can't, not my personal opinion, it's, it's a generally established, well-established approach in any kind of uh, you know, if you, if you study it at the university law, maybe in your first couple of months, you will learn that principle. So belonging to a group only cannot be considered as a criminal action. Case closed. I mean, you don't need to talk about anything else. You can talk about individuals, though. Let's say, um, you know, let's say you belong to the group and you commit something, like you, you commit a crime. 
bribery, conspiracy, anything, even capital crimes. You are belonging to this group. The group has nothing to do with your criminal action unless there is evidence proving that. So in Turkey, what's happening is when you belong to Gulen organization or you're sympathizing with that organization, you're automatically a terrorist. So this is really insane. Sounds really not logical, but it's, it's happening. All right. So, um, good. No, I, I'm going to get five minutes, Mr. Chairman, because other, other people, they, they had a little bit more time. So, okay. Don't make me use Erdogan's methods, okay? Don't make me use Erdogan's methods. Otherwise, I'm going to use Ernest. Okay, I'm just joking. Good. Okay, let's let's come to the uh, numbers. Okay, so uh, what happened with the Gulen movement? Okay, so th those numbers are also very striking. Now I give you a number. It's hard to believe it's real, but you can check it. Google it if you don't believe me. Okay, the number is 2.5 million. What is it? It's not the lottery that the, the person in Turkey won, okay? It's not the lottery big prize. 2.5 million individuals in Turkey who underwent criminal investigations following the 2016 military coup attempt. Guys, is it possible 2.5 million terrorists in a country? I'm just asking this simple question. Is it logical? Because if there is even like 100,000 or a million you can achieve your goal. You don't need more people. 2.5 million, it's like unbelievable. 170,000 public servants dismissed through unconstitutional decrees. This is also insane. Another number, 8,000 academics. I am one of them. A couple of colleagues here in this uh, room, other examples, who lost their positions at universities without any evidence that they committed anything like crime. 400 jail journalists already, right now, there are plus 400 journalists are in jail in Turkey. So another really interesting, uh, uh, very interesting number I want to uh, mention here. So Turkey, has taken extensive measures resulting in the removal of 2,745 Turkish judges from their positions, judges, without any criminal investigation. And 2,204 were in the criminal judiciary. Those judges were in, in the criminal judiciary. And that makes approximately 36% of all judges in Turkey, 36% of all judges, the government wakes up one day and out of the blue, they say, oh, you know what? We understood. They were actually terrorists. Hey, they were working. They had been working for the government, for the judiciary for 10 years, five years. How did you hire them if they were terrorists? How did you realize right now out of the blue, overnight, that they are terrorists, okay? This is insane. Um, another number, 7,899 police officers were purged. Imagine, those people, they are considered terrorists. They had weapons, they had power. It's the law enforcement. It's not a joke. If they were terrorists, I wonder, why didn't they do anything with their terrorism capacity when they were in power, when they were police officers, right? So it's, it's also interesting. So um, another, that, that's my last in, uh, indicator or number, and it's really insane again. More than 50% of all admirals and generals in Turkish forces, the government said overnight, out of the blue again, they were terrorists, actually they're traitors. More than 50% of all generals and admirals. Can you imagine how many hundreds of thousands of soldiers they were commanding? Turkey is in active service. More than 600,000 soldiers, 
second largest NATO army in the world, <laughs> okay? So those admirals, they were actually commanding over 300,000 soldiers. And they didn't do anything as long as they were in, in their own, own position. Now, conclusion. Looking ahead, it's important to ask why Turkey is still called a democracy. This is the whole message I want to give you today. Why do we call this country still a democracy? Okay, it's a fragile democracy. It's a backsliding democracy. Don't give me any adjectives. Why still using democracy for a country like that? So the lack of a precise definition is the main problem because we political scientists, we know what democracy is. But most of the people, the lie men, they have zero idea what democracy is. They think, oh, there are elections, as I mentioned in the very beginning of my presentation, there are elections in Turkey every four years. And opposition is very competitive. We see that you know, they won Istanbul municipality, Ankara municipality. They have zero idea about theory. And our job is we need to talk about those things more often. And uh, I don't want to torture, torture you more. Thank you very much for your uh, interest. And I'm looking forward to your questions.